Good evening. It's really nice to see you. My son Menachem greeted me when I came back and said it's good for you to come and visit here. <laughs> I found myself so much away, so it is a pleasure to be home. Can I countermand one instruction that Menachem gave? Could you please all put your cell phones on? The reason is because you spend so much time trying to work out exactly your personality jingle and song. When it plays, I get to know you much better. <laughs> and uh, when those people around you become very annoyed, that lets me know a lot about them as well. So feel completely free. We'll have a nice little concert here as we go along. So I don't mind it in the slightest. I challenge you, okay? <laughs> Fine. I came back from overseas from a lecture tour, but I also attended the wedding of Joseph Chris. And this center is called the Joseph Chris Center. And the Joseph Chris wedding that I attended was the grandson of the person after whom this center is named. So it was a great pleasure to be there for that purpose alone as well. Now, you don't look particularly stressed. Maybe I can stress you a little bit. You know, the world we live in is a world that's radically different from what was the case even a few generations ago. And of course, the singular factor that most people point to is the pace of change around us and our capacity or lack of thereof, of being able to keep pace with all the changes. Once upon a time, we would step out of our family home, which would be in an agriculturally based society, and we would see the horizon comfortably the same every single day. Today, if you live in the big cities, the streetscape keeps changing almost monthly. We used to live under the one roof as an extended family. Three, four, five generations living contemporaneously at the same time under the one roof. Grandparents, parents, children, grandchildren and the like. We learnt the gifts and the art of communication face to face. We were able to learn wisdom by osmosis, by living with our elders. And today we live in a nuclear family, 2.2 children. They leave eventually, leaving two under the one roof. And with the breakdown of families and relationships today, often it's one person under the roof. And therefore, the way that we relate to each other has also undergone a real transformation. Furthermore, the accessibility that people have to us is multiplied geometrically. People can reach us everywhere all the time. They reach us in our bedroom, they reach us in our toilet, because we've got that singular item called the cell phone, as they call it overseas, or the mobile phone. And we're juggling. And not only that, we're being habituated, our brains are being wired, to respond to the cue of the jingle as if that call is going to be the singular most transformative moment in our life. <laughs> and if we don't respond to that, there is a sense of edginess, and not only you, but everyone around you at the same time. Why doesn't he take the phone? It's totally irrational, but it's very real. Now, multiply all the stressors that we live currently through and the capacities of the mind to be able to juggle them at the same moment and you realize that we are in need of technique. We are in need of changing the way that our minds assimilate to the world we live in and especially to tame our emotions. So much of what I'm going to say this evening deals with that particular arena. So those of you who uh, realize you've come to absolutely the wrong lecture, this is a good time to get up and make room for others, okay? Otherwise you're stuck here for the duration. When we speak in terms of stress and stressors, what is it that we're talking about? 
So I'll give you a pragmatic, dynamic definition. Stress occurs when people don't behave the way you want them to. And that results in fear and agitation. And guess what? People will not behave the way you want them to, especially your children. <laughs> and therefore, under those circumstances, it appears that we are condemned to a life of stress. Stress is an interpretation. It really depends how we refer to the challenge of the moment. Menachem mentioned specific stressors. I've noted the three that I think are the ones that summarize the totality of our lives. They are in terms of personal significance, self-esteem, meaning the sense of worth, that I make a difference in breathing, in speaking, in living, that I'm not a single digit in a statistic in the government registry, that there's something worthwhile in my being reincarnated into the world of now. There's a lot of doubt about that. And that's one particular area of stress that I will be referring to. Another arena, of course, is, as Menachem said, relationships. And we're not good at relationships. And the reason we're not good at relationships is because we aren't taught skills of relationship. And perhaps more poignantly, we haven't been provided with the correct modelling. And also, the value systems of a Western culture that's in some respects degenerating also has a multiplier effect generationally. So we've got those factors we have to contend with. And then there's the third factor of security. And now that the global economies are all intertwined, and we can't really speak of a safe economy here and a safe economy there, but as a consequence of the communication system, all the economies are interconnected, it means that there isn't a safety valve. You can't run away to a country like my parents did called Australia back in the 1940s when they did so after the Second World War and it was a safe haven because today we're part of the extended world and we're at the mercy of the totality of the world. And then at a micro level, we don't necessarily relate well to governmental policies or the fact that the banking industry doesn't comply or the fact that we don't have the sense of income security on a daily basis. These are all very real stressors. But the point that I'm going to be making very strongly this evening is that a stressor is only one if you interpret it as such. There was a wonderful early pioneer of, of the academic study of stress, and his name was Hans Selye. And Hans Selye coined the term eustress, E-U-stress, E-U is positive, meaning you can certainly transform a stressor into a positive virtue. More of that also as we go along this evening. Let's just take care of some of the early homework. Most of this data you are familiar with, I'm sure. There are symptoms of stress. I don't want you to run away and say, oh, that's me, because it has to be a whole range of them and you have to become fairly dysfunctional to be really over the edge. But the cognitive emotional symptoms of stress, which we have to take as warnings, are the ones I've listed there. And they're the ones you see often in the magazines as well as in the learned uh, uh, research papers. There are also the physical and behavioral ones. Um, and these are very real and even more debilitating for people in context of their everyday life. So these particular features are ones that we are being treated for most often. In fact, one of the features of the United States where I often go and I stay at hotels and I turn on the TV set because I want to observe the advertising, because the advertising to me gives me a clue of where the society is at. What are they buying? 
and why are they buying it and the like. Two out of three ads in the United States deals with health and wellness. Well, actually not. Deals with sickness. Actually not. Deals with symptoms of sickness and the pharmaceutical industry dominates by providing masking mechanisms. If you can mask a symptom, then you're okay. But we're being programmed that illness is a norm. And the idea of prevention and maintenance is totally absent. I think to a great extent that's also true of Australia. And it's that kind of a cultural milieu that we are being programmed for right here at the very same time. Some other straightforward pieces of information that you are familiar with, I'm sure. The kind of stress-related illnesses per se that are underlying the kind of symptoms that we saw on the previous slide. Heart disease, digestive problems, sleep problems, depression, obesity, autoimmune, skin conditions and the like. Now, we're not saying for one moment that these are exclusively the domain of stress. There are many causes for many of these manifestations. But stress is a singular factor that, that contributes to these and a whole range. So if we can eliminate some of that, then we're going to help ourselves considerably. And then the preventatives, which I want to deal with tonight. The first one is our attitudinal response. In other words, what is our default, habitual response to any stressor that affects us in life? When I say habitual response, I'm going to be talking shortly in terms of the way that we program our brains in ways which set ourselves up to be stressed. Because I'm going to say to you that you have a choice in the way that you interpret the reality of life. And that choice derives from an inner duality, which we'll discuss in Kabbalistic and Hasidic terms. In other words, you can move into a fear response, which comes from our lower order self, Nefesh Bahamis, which deals with the integrity of the physical body as such. And you fear for your safety and well-being because that stressor is getting through to you. Or you can choose to create a shield. And the shield derives from the way that you interpret that. Meaning, is it a stressor? Do I have the capacity to overcome? Is it a challenge that is going to afford me an opportunity of growth and success? And really, to be able to move away from the kind of uh, thinking um, which is uh, obsessive thinking or thinking of the worst case scenarios, which often people jump to, to train ourselves to step back to a position of neutrality so that we can actually define it in a way which is much more balanced. That's to do with our Chochmah mechanism, which I'll speak a little bit more later on. Step number one. Step number two is to be able to tame our emotions. There are two ways that we can respond to a stressor. One is emotionally. Now, emotional response is valid in many circumstances. The problem with emotions are that emotions do not have any direction. They don't possess any wisdom. There's no compass bearing. That lies in the mind. And therefore, our ability to tame the emotions, or I prefer to say, provide a compass bearing for appropriate emotions or intelligent emotions, means that we have to be able to balance the emotion with the direction of the mind. So the emotions are also, in our teachings, in our psycho-spiritual system, nominated. There are seven basic emotional tendencies, and we learn how to tame those. I'm just raising the headlines at the moment. Then there's the issue of information. Do I have enough data to actually formulate a conclusion that this is a true threat? And I'm going to teach you this evening that you have the capacity to use your five senses in such a way that you can collect dozens of pieces of information 
so that you have much better capacities to draw conclusions rather than draw the immediate habitual dis response mechanism based on fear. So how to use our senses to collect data. Then there's the issue of coping strategies. All right, I've learned now how to gather the data. I've learned how to create some inner sense of quiet. Now how do I respond? How does my mind actually read the situation? How do I give the compass bearing? How do I derive a strategy of response? How do I train in that strategy of response? So that becomes my new norm. That becomes the new transformative me that's able to respond to the previously characterized fears with confidence and even with interest. Finally, wisdom. It's an intangible. But the idea that you can become wise in a way that is trainable is very true within our Jewish spiritual tradition. Wisdom, which we usually somehow associate sagaciously with the older people and the people of a life experience, I can assure you is something that can be gained much earlier in life. And today, given the kind of world we live in, we really do need to be able to gain the wisdom factor much sooner than our predecessors did. So one of the approaches that has been adopted in the world at large comes in the category of mindfulness. And the term mindfulness has wonderful application although it was a translation of a Buddhist term that made it popular in our contemporary scene, the idea of mindfulness is obvious, that your mind is fully there. I'm here now. Be here now. When you're sitting and discussing something with a friend, be here now. Don't have your mind wandering over there and over there. Of course we can multitask, and women are particularly good at it. But guess what? It doesn't make for deep and meaningful relationships. In the area of relationships, it's actually a hazard to be multitasking while you're relating. But the truth is, we shouldn't really multitask at all. You should be, be here now and be fully there. And in so doing, it means that you have to be much better a manager of your time and a manager of people so that you can afford those precious moments to be here now rather than to be there and there and there at the very same moment. And then derives the idea of what is the Jewish spiritual teaching of the nature of mindfulness. Consciousness. Awareness are synonyms that are often used for mindfulness. Where does consciousness reside? What is consciousness? What does it mean to be conscious, to be aware? And the answer is focus. And if you're able to learn to focus, and I'm not talking about a generic focus of the mind, I'm talking about a focus of consciousness, an application of kavana. The word kavana usually is translated as intention. But if you ask yourself, what does intention mean? What does it mean to have an intention? What's happening where within the body to create an intention? Intention means to direct and focus the flow of consciousness. Again, kavana Intention is the capacity to focus the flow of consciousness. And I'll demonstrate to you that you have that ability in some very wonderful ways which you didn't even realize. Please take your index fingers and allow them to touch like this. Okay, I want you to work out which of your two fingers is touching which. <laughs> okay, as soon as you've moved beyond the Zen Buddhist koan there, I want you to be able to work out which one is the active toucher and which one is the passive touchy. And you'll find that one of them is active, the other one is passive. See if you can work that out. Now, when you have worked that out, I want you to switch. I want you to make the other one the active toucher and the alternate one, the passive touchy. 
You can do it. <laughs> and when you've achieved that, switch back. Okay. Some of you in this room, and I suspect the majority, have been able to demonstrate to themselves that you have the capacity to direct the flow of consciousness. You can direct the flow of consciousness through one finger or the other finger. Now, I know that some of you are going to be walking out of this room trying to work out, what's he talking about? I can't do it, and the like. But you really can. And if you can do it with your fingers, you can do it with any part of your body. In other words, you have the capacity to choose the nature of your consciousness. We call that kavana in our tradition. So the mindfulness that we practice is called kavana mindfulness. More about that as we move along. That's the flow of the soul and how we direct the flow of the soul as such. What are the seven habits that I want to raise this evening in context of this discussion? Number one, how to clear the mind for inner balance. People who are less stressed or hopefully not stressed know this to be a cardinal point around the pivot around which all life is able to swing around. That becomes the fulcrum. The capacity at any one moment when stress seems to be impending, momentarily disconnect, achieve a level playing field within of inner calm and peace, because from there you can begin the process of balanced interpretation. So you don't have hysterical responses. You don't have responses that are on the edge. Because you're beginning from a position which allows you a balanced interpretation. That's step one. And we'll do so soon a little exercise in terms of uh, demonstrating the capacity of training for that. The second is to empower your positivity gene. Now, some of you will say, I missed out on that one. <laughs> but I want to tell you, you certainly are able to implant it. Figuratively speaking, and that goes back to the way that we can, as the emerging field of neuroplasticity is teaching us, reformulate the interpretive manner in which we read life. Again, I'll discuss that shortly. Three, people who are able to handle stress well possess self-worth. They recognize that their being in this room here this evening or living a life at the moment is not an accident, but it's synchronized to what the world needs at this very moment. Each person in this room is absolutely essential to life today. The world could not exist without you being here. But more importantly, without your personal giftedness, we are going to be missing out. So to be able to express that self-worth through your giftedness to all of us is a terribly important factor in life. But in passing, once you recognize and know that, from there flows self-esteem. Four, how to exercise the five senses. As I said earlier, you have the capacity to raise much more information around you if you do the uh, Kavana mindfulness program that I've designed that's in the back there, you should be able to do this after a period of only six, seven weeks. You should be able to move your head from one shoulder around to the other shoulder, take 30 seconds to do that, swing, and pick up with your five senses no less than 100 identifiable, memorized pieces of information as a consequence of that motion. Some of you will say, but that's impossible. Not only is it not impossible, it's highly probable. We don't train in this arena. We train in maths, we train in law, we train in all sorts of disciplines in life as such, but one thing we do not train is our capacity to grow as a person, to use all our facilities to a much higher degree than what we are currently expressing. That's just one example of it. Number five, fishing in the pond of creativity. 
How do you draw on your creativity? Everybody here in this room has their personal vantage point of life. You have your own soul. The soul is able to read life individually the only way that you can, that no second person can. How do you draw that from within you? Is it trainable? Or is it something that comes as a fluke or otherwise? And the answer is, of course, it's trainable. And I'll show you this evening a little mystical spiritual exercise to do with the mind itself, how you can open, away, open up your gateway of creativity and wisdom. Six, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> Stephen Covey's uh, statement and adage holds true right throughout, to be a focused individual. That goes back to our discussion of multitasking and goes to the point of being here now. And finally, the power of positive thinking. In other words, habituating yourself so that your new default response mechanism is to be able to interpret the moment in a way which is likely to lead to solution rather than the flight response. Okay, so that's a summary of the seven habits, and I'm going to uh, uh, share with you three training mechanisms that puts a number of these into practice this evening. The three training steps are, number one, how to induce inner calm, how to create a level playing field. And another exercise that we'll practice this evening is how to utilize our senses in a wide angle so that we derive sensory perception in a very real way, collecting much more information. That's good. I like that. That was good. No, no, no. That's, see, that's a highly verbal response to the phone call, yeah. Okay. Gates of wisdom, how to enter into your mind, which I mentioned a few moments earlier. Okay. The first one, creating a level playing field. Inner calm, inner peace, especially at the moment of provocation, especially at the moment of stress, especially when you're being yelled at, especially when tomorrow becomes very uncertain for you. That is the moment that we have to apply our skill base. Dr. Herbert Benson, in the 1980s, demonstrated through research that when you practice this particular momentary uh, exercise of inner peace, you actually change the physiology of the body in a very definitive way. As you see, you've got these factors taking place which are measurable scientifically. These are not anecdotal pieces of information. These are things that are actually measured. When you practice this, you decrease heart rate, respiratory rate, muscle tension, oxygen consumption, metabolic rate, analytical thinking. You increase skin resistance and, uh, and you increase alpha wave activity from the brain. This is something that you can achieve consciously. It's trainable in a number of different ways. Biofeedback is one very significant way of training this as well as other things. But I'll show you a much simpler way of doing it. In fact, why don't we do something now? What I'd like you to do is put everything out of your hands onto the ground. Don't worry, it'll be there afterwards. We're not going to levitate it. <laughs> I'd like you to put your hands on your knees and thighs, feet symmetrically on the ground, back fairly straight, head well balanced on your shoulders, and gently close your eyes. And just focus on your breath, just breathing normally in and out. Prefer to breathe in through the nose if you can. And become aware of the difference in temperature of the air entering the nostrils and the air exiting from the nostrils. Cooler air entering, warmer air exiting.
take a deeper and slower breath in and out. <coughs> and with your next breath, force the breath down to your abdominal area, apparently past the lungs, and expand the abdomen as you breathe in, creating space and contract the abdomen as you breathe out. So it's as if you're using the abdomen as a pump. So take a deep breath in, expanding the abdomen, collecting the air, and then contracting the abdomen to breathe out. This is a little counterintuitive, so practice it for a few more breaths. Breathing in deeply, down to the abdomen, expanding the abdomen, and then contracting the abdomen. And now let's lend some rhythm to the breathing. We'll breathe in for a count of three, hold for a count of three, and breathe out for a count of four. So take a slow, deep breath in, two, three, hold, two, three, out, two, three, four. In, two, three, hold, two, three, out, two, three, four. And just continue. You can change the counts, but keep it rhythmic. <coughs> Allow your breathing to be graceful, smooth, smooth transition from in to out and from out to in. And now bring your focus back to the temperature differential between the air as it enters the nostrils and the air as it exits from the nostrils. And begin moving your fingers and toes here in the room. Move your fingers, move your toes. And when you're ready, gently open your eyes, coming all the way back. This is what Dr. Benson experimented with. A simple breathing technique devoid of any uh, spiritual or religious overtones, purely pragmatic, and definitively changing the way your body responds. And now let me assure you that if you practice this singular technique in such a way that after a matter of some weeks you're able to reduce the totality of that exercise to less than five seconds, and I kid you not, you are armed with a very important weapon against stress. And you are able to practice that in such a way, and I teach it to you on that uh, package in the back, on how to be able to first do it for 45 minutes, then reduce it to uh, 5 minutes, then reduce it to 10 seconds, and then reduce it to one breath over a period of weeks. And from that position that you gain from the position of inner peace and quiet that you experienced, and you would have experienced it in a reality, you're able to begin the next subsequent steps. The Rebbe noted on many occasions that you can change everything about yourself, everything about yourself. The first item is called Shinui Hateva, which means to change your nature. You're able to change your nature. I know that you've been taught that genetics creates the personality that you are, and if that hasn't completed the job, then you also have the problems of environmental processing that also shape you, and therefore you're a creature of those two uh, uh, fomenters of your personality and response. But what more recent research shows, um, Professor Sonia Liebemirsky, 
um, Dr. Tal Shahar, both indicate in their very, very well re uh, researched data over the last three years that genetic predisposition counts for your, what's called your set point, 50% of who you are. Your environment or life circumstances counts for another 10%. But there's 40% that is open to free will and your choice. Now, if you have a pie chart, which I didn't uh, manage to put into the uh, program here, you'd be able to very easily see how significant is your freedom and capacity to choose who you are or wish to be. But most people do not exercise their choice. They begin with the position that I'm a slave of my genes and my environment, and therefore they don't practice that freedom, unfortunately. And Hasidus and Kabbalah gives us another very telling virtue of this. When you exercise choice, you recharacterize your genetic predisposition and your environmental processing. And that's what I'll shortly talk in terms of uh, uh, um, the plasticity of the mind. That you can actually change the inner nature of your being down to the cellular level of the body. That we are dynamic. We're a constantly dynamic piece of art. We're constantly in a state of change. But we, the deeper self, whoever you, the deeper self is, has the capacity to direct the change. You can be who you want to be. And that's not just a motivational adage, that is an absolute scientific truth. And that's very, very important to know. So when the Rebbe said, Shinoi Hateva, you can change your very nature. And then said the methodology of training is, Hamesa Hu Ikar, that the main thing is the behavioral practice of things. You change yourself by the doingness of life, you don't change yourself as much by the thinkingness of life. I know that many of us tend towards academic orientations and our life is all about thought, especially that's the characterization of Jewish people. But the truth is, Jewish peoplehood has survived not because of our cleverness of mind, but because of our continual practice of what we need to do in life to be a Jew. And it's the practice that we're learning that creates the change also now scientifically within. You want to change the grooves of the mind, you have to do things with your hands, with your feet, with your body that creates that change. More of that shortly. So, you can be the artist of what your brain is. The brain is, of course, becoming increasingly fascinating as research continues. I know we've got 50 trillion brain cells. Now, imagine if two brain cells were able to speak to each other. That's pretty good. What if um, one brain cell could speak to 10 brain cells? That's pretty good. Did you know that the 50 trillion brain cells all speak to each other at the very same time? That's called a biofeedback loop. And that's something absolutely amazing. By the way, if you can't get your head around 50 trillion brain cells, just think of how many bodies there are in the uh, Milky Way, and you've got 50 million also, so estimated. They keep discovering more and more. But the point is, it's a lot. But the interesting and fascinating thing is how they communicate with each other almost instantly. Now, there are two parts of that communication. One part of that communication is um, a one that continues in the uh, background, like our bodies function despite ourselves. You don't have to think to make this cell do this work and that cell to that do that work. It continues. The brain is able to organize all that. But the other part is the brain is not you. You are not the brain. The brain is your facilitator. The mind operates the brain. That's how the textbooks have it today. We say it in a more profound sense. Your neshama, your soul, is the, capac the capacity to be able to shape the brain the way 
it wants to. And that's identified with you, the source of consciousness. When I say you, I'm talking about your consciousness, I'm talking about your soul, I'm talking about that part of you that is able to actually take control of many of the aspects of the brain as an act of choice. I can think positive in the face of challenge. I do not have to be a slave of fear. And how to train that so that the brain actually becomes that interpretation of the moment. This is something that you have freedom over and it's very, very important to understand that. The more you behave in a certain way, the more that adage that you see now up there applies. Neurotransmitters that fire together, wire together. What does that mean? There's a language in here, a language that is spoken between the cells, so to speak, those 50 trillion cells. And that language is called neurotransmission. And what we have, the cells have little extensions, which are called tendrils and axons, and uh, they have uh, ways of connecting with other tendrils and axons of the cell next door, the neighboring cell over the back fence, and that back fence is called the synapsis, and they continue to talk like that to each other. And if you don't drive it, life simply forms the pattern that takes place within. If you don't apply consciousness and choice, what happens to you here is passive. It's real, but it's passive. You have no choice about it. When she yells at me, I immediately feel rage. When that driver cuts me off on the road, I immediately feel anger. And I'll do that all my life. I'll feel anger all my life. I'll be an angry person or I'll be a fearful person. I'll be an insecure individual, whatever the negativities are, because that's the passive adoption of patterns that you've allowed. But you can change the language. You can change the pattern in which the neurotransmitters operate. You can actually organize it so that you have new grooves of the mind. And that's carried out by repetition over and over and over again of a new, what will become default, pattern of interpretation, which comes through behavior. Very important to know that you have the capacity and the freedom to do that. It's become now much more uh, common in the treatment of uh, people who unfortunately suffer from uh, stroke and say, an arm is not working or a leg is not working. Well, previously, the way that occupational therapy op operated was that what you would do is make the person skillful with their other arm and their other leg. The more modern technique is, no, you strap their good arm to their body, you immobilize their good leg, and force them to intend to use the arm that apparently is immobile or the legs that are apparently immobile. And through the strength of ongoing intention, kavana, onwards and onwards, you have an accelerating rate of recovery of that arm. That's what we're demonstrating today. Because you have the power within the mind to change the pathways. If this pathway doesn't work because of, unfortunately, what's called a stroke, the body is able, through the brain, to create new pathways, new neural pathways. This is fairly new, but it's really real and it's existed all our lives. We've just been taught other things, unfortunately, and believe them. This is very, very important to realize because the basis of everything that is, how I'll use the word, holy in Judaism, revolves around exercise of choice, being a free individual. And you have to exercise that freedom and you have to practice that freedom. Most of the decision-making processes take place in the CEO of the brain called the uh, prefrontal cortex. And that's where you're able to alter the decision-making process, right there, so that the word that comes out of your mouth and the behavior you exhibit is different than what would have been the case had you not given it conscious thought and not exercised free will. If you interpret stress 
negatively, it's going to hurt you. And the more you do that, the more it's going to continuously hurt you until it becomes something that destroys you emotionally, destroys you mentally, destroys you behaviorally, because you haven't exercised the choice to undo that interpretation. How many of you here play the piano? Yeah. Wonderful, we've got at least a dozen hands up. Okay, so you dozen people have inspired the rest of our 70, 80 people in the room to take up piano tomorrow. But we are modern individuals and we're not going to study piano the way that you old fuddy duddies did. What we're going to do is we're going to tackle this scientifically. We're going to first spend a year surveying the scene. We're going to look at all the classical pianists and composers of history. We're going to look at uh, Mozart, and we're going to look at Haydn and Schumann and Tchaikovsky and Chopin and all of them, and we're going to choose the one we like. And we come across one day the haunting melody of Peter and the Wolf, and we say, that's my man. And you spend a year studying him, and you're able to recognize the style of his note juxtapositions compared to someone else. You're able to recognize a certain pattern in that person's compositions compared to others. You're able to learn the theory of music in that year very successfully. At the end of 12 months, you say, I know it. You can now give your dissertation, but what you do then is, I'm ready and you sit down to the piano for the first time because you know it and you say fingers do your stuff and guess what <coughs> the fingers don't do their stuff <laughs> now that's really strange if i know it why don't the extremities of my body know it and you say but it's obvious it's not so obvious at all what does knowing mean? What part of your body knows things? But now we know full well, especially through scanning techniques of the brain, that to know something means to be able to create grooves of the mind that encompass the totality of the body. And until you actually put your fingers on the keyboard and practice the scales the way that these fuddy-duddies did, and actually repeat it over and over again, you haven't created the discussion of neurotransmitters in the mind that extends to the fingers themselves. And the more you practice, 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 the more you do create completion of that loop. That's the same, exactly the same, in terms of life. And in this instance, in terms of stress. If you don't give yourself the freedom to undo the conversation in there that creates the fear and makes you therefore respond inadequately under stressful circumstance or to recognize it only as a stress, then you won't be able to cope. But if you can redefine it and allow the fingers of life to be able to play the music of wisdom, then under those circumstances, your resultant life is going to be that much more successful. It's exactly the same. The issue of power of gratitude. One of the important habits of de-stressed people is that they always express gratitude. And there's a lot of uh, writings currently in newspapers of research that demonstrates that. A number of companies have taken training programs for their employees to practice gratitude. And that has changed the quality of the employees' lives in terms of a quantum of happiness, however happiness is uh, measured, something we'll look at in the next course. And what we learn is the more you say thank you, the more likely you're going to have leveled experiences of relationships with people and the more you're going to be able to respond to negatively minded people more successfully. Now, what is it about a thank you? I mean, what happens when you say thank you? What's the dynamics of a thank you? What's happening when you say thank you? When you say thank you, something very profound is happening. You're shifting the center of gravity from you to the other. That's what you're doing. 
Thank you, a genuine thank you means I, at this moment, do not focus on self, I focus on the other. Most of the time I'm dealing with myself, but when I say genuine thank you, at that moment, I am focusing on you. This is a transformation. As I often say, some of you have heard me say this over and over again, if someone is yelling at you, then rather than the default response being one of stressed and therefore defense, which means you yell back because you have to assert yourself. Because when someone's yelling at you, somehow or other they're pulling out the rug from under your feet. You don't feel good about yourself. And the only way you feel good about yourself, if you self-aggrandize yourself with vocal cords and body posture, right? But all you're doing is performing like a monkey. <laughs> you're aping them. They behave like that, so you behave like that. You become a victim. You become a puppet at the end of the other string by raising your voice and yelling back. Instead, why don't you take this approach? Hoda'a, which means they're yelling and screaming, that means they're in pain. Because people don't yell and scream unless there's emotional pain or physical pain. Therefore, what can I do to assist them? What have I done? I said, thank you, Hashem, for allowing this person to yell at me because this calls on my higher self to respond much more adequately and train me to be a gratitude-oriented person, which leads, by the way, to a much happier life. That's shifting the center of gravity of self, ego, it's all about me, how dare you speak to me like that, to otherness. The reason why they're yelling at me is because Hashem trusts me to be the best therapist in the moment. Now let me live up to the uh, uh, possibility of that. And that's why we Jewish people in the morning begin the first moments of consciousness with the affirmation called Modeani. Mode from Hoda'a, which is etymologically linked to Todda Rabba, thank you. In other words, we begin with an affirmation of being able to express gratitude that my giftedness on this day is able to be displayed to others. This changes the whole milieu of your response to stressors. The way that you interpret the challenge becomes radically different. And therefore, not an issue of how do I actually change that stress and get rid of the stress, but stress need not arise. Because your vantage point in life is very different. It's other-centered, not self-centered. It's nefesh elokit oriented, not nefesh bahamit oriented, as we say in our lexicon. Okay. Now, another aspect of self-worth and self-esteem is what I said earlier. You have lived many, many times before. You have been reincarnated into this particular lifetime because in this lifetime you can offer something that no one else can as you did in previous lifetimes. And that means you're unique. And that means you're special. And if you recognize that, your capacity to deal with life's circumstances becomes leveraged. It becomes spiritually leveraged. It becomes emotionally leveraged because of the way that you interpret. Everything that I'm saying may sound like wisdom sayings, but I'm talking in terms of implanting these systematically into your consciousness so they become a real part of who you are. Taking the next step. You know, you read the philosophies of life and you read wisdom teachings in many traditions and we Jewish people in our traditions, but there's a step that's often left out. Okay, this is great, I really learned about it. But does that make it you? Have you internalized it? Have you made that you? Have you owned that wisdom? Has it made you truly wise? How many people lead, unfortunately, schizophrenic lives? On one hand, they're all-knowing individuals, on the other hand, their behavior is appalling. They may be religious, not religious, irrelevant. That schizophrenic vantage point of how you present yourself means you're not at peace at one with yourself and you certainly haven't internalized the wisdoms. You can't respond to stress unless you internalize the wisdoms. And the only way to internalize them, practice, practice, practice. And that's got to be done systematically. 
You've got to have a program to do that. In the same way as you do any program out there in terms of self-change. When you're dealing with a naughty child, a naughty parent, a naughty employee, employer, you have to become aware of each one of these features. You have to be aware of the tonal qualities and the texture of the voice. You have to be aware of what the words are implying, the subtext. You have to be aware of your body temperature, your heart, your cold, what's happening in the room, because that affects the way you respond, as does body cues, spatial relationships. How far away is the person standing from you? What's the furniture arrangement in the room? We're going to talk more about those features when we have our session as part of this course with Neuro Linguistic Programming, NLP, with Marvin Oka here. Then there's mood filters. What was I just involved in 10 minutes, 20 minutes ago that's going to affect the way that I am at the moment or my child at the moment? Sensory data. What are my five senses picking up? Do I have a consciousness strategy that I'm dealing with? What are the goals and purpose of this meeting? Are they going to be met? How fast am I processing this information? Am I able to process it in real time so that the words that are coming out of my mouth are truly wise? I've only placed up there maybe 5% of the data that you must be picking up with your five senses in order to be able to have sufficient information to be wise in the moment. Let's do a little exercise with the senses. Put everything down on the ground again. <coughs> Feet symmetrically on the ground. Hands resting on knees and thighs. Gently close your eyes. And focus on your breath. We need to have a level playing field before we begin any exercise. Focus on the difference in temperature between the air entering your nostrils and the air exiting. Be aware of cool air entering, warm air exiting. Breathe in deeply down to the abdomen and out from the abdomen. Make it rhythmic, make it smooth. Become aware of the sounds in the room. Subtle sounds of people, subtle sounds even of the projector, the humming of the air conditioning, sounds filtering in from the outside, sounds that were here all the time but you were oblivious to them. They didn't register as important data. <coughs> Become aware of your fingers touching the material of your clothing. The texture of the material. the temperature of your fingertips. The sense of touch. Become aware of what your eyes see at the back of your eyelids. Shape, movement, pattern, 
projections from the imagination. Become aware of your tongue in your mouth and discover any residual tastes in your mouth, your taste buds. Become aware of any scent fragrance around you, from you. Are you able to be conscious of more than one sense at the same time? By the end of a training program, you would be aware of all five senses, especially with your eyes open and multiplying the sensual data. Focus again on your breathing, gently breathing in and breathing out. Move your fingers and your toes. And when you're ready, open your eyes, coming all the way back. The Hebrew word for breath is neshima. The Hebrew word for soul is neshama. Breath is the first level of consciousness of the soul in the world of time and space. And therefore, if you breathe correctly, you allow the first opening of the window of the soul to move into this world in a much more balanced state. And that's why breath work in this regard is very good and very important. And then if you're able to have the second aspect of training of collecting the myriads of pieces of information that the senses provide, then not only are you springing from a level playing field of inner peace, but at the same time you're collecting sufficient information so that the next word that you express, the next behavior that you exhibit, is that much more wise in the moment. See how it's building together and all the other features that we've spoken about also. I want to just spend a few moments explaining a little bit about the map of the soul. The way that we understand all these various features from a Jewish spiritual vantage point. Now, in this rather complex diagram, I've probably summarized the first 52 <coughs> chapters of a work called the Book of Tanya, Sefer Tanya. So if it appears a little bit complex, it is. But basically, what you see on screen is 10 emanations called Sefirot from a source called the Ein Sof. Ein Sof, literally in Hebrew, translates without end, infinity, or metaphor for God, creator. The creator formulates four realms of consciousness, or four realms of cosmos. Doesn't matter how we view it. They have names, we're not going to deal with it. This one down here, Asiya, is the realm of time and space. This is where we are right now, consciously. This is where we live every day, consciously. This is where the existential meaning in life derives from. This realm of Yetzirah has no time, no space. Can't even begin to imagine it. But Bria makes it look concrete. And Atsilus makes Bria look material. So each is a quantum leap removed. Similarly, your consciousness has levels. In contemporary psychology, this field has become known as metaconsciousness. And metaconsciousness means being conscious of being conscious. 
right? What does that really mean? Well, if you're reading a book, and what's happened is, after reading a page, you discover nothing's gone in. Here's the question. What part of you became conscious that you weren't being conscious? That's what that stu those studies are all about. Except that in our system, we've got at least four basic levels. Consciousness of being conscious, of being conscious, of being conscious. So it becomes a little more complex, okay? And then when these ten flows flow through these consciousness realms, three of them become known as, sorry, that shouldn't have happened, three of them become known as mind, these three, so to speak, and the other seven are emotions, meaning as they transcend through those realms or refract spiritually through the realms down into a seer, they become your mind and emotion. That's very important because this is all about who you are. These ten flows, as they refract through here, become this singular flow that becomes known as your soul. That is your soul. So the soul is a spiritual umbilical cord. It's not a point within. It extends, you are here in a seer, but you extend all the way through. And sometimes you can experience there higher states of consciousness, dream states, more profound states, an inner knowing. I don't know where I got that from. It just came from somewhere. Nothing comes from nowhere. Everything comes from somewhere. It's just that we don't have the exploration tools usually to be able to assess where it's coming from. This flow, which I call the soul, is the seat of consciousness. It's the seat of mindfulness. It's the seat of awareness. That's what we are directing when we consciously direct it between two fingers and allow yourself to repaint the nature of reality the way you choose. There are three specific features of mindfulness. And that's important to know because these are the main tools against stress. Chachma, Bina and Da'at. You have right brain activity, we're told, and that's creative and inductive. That's the Chachma aspect. The Bina aspect is left brain activity, more analytical and methodical. And then you have that part which really deals with mindfulness, Da'at. Da'at is the focusing mechanism. Da'at is what integrates. Da'at is what shines the light of your awareness here now. That brings it together. But the way you see that what is under that light depends on left brain analytical activity data, information, the sensory exercise that we <laughs> utilized before as an example. And it depends on how you go fishing in the pond of your subconsciousness, your creative self. And what is your creative self? So we've said earlier that there is a certain feedback loop that everything that you perceive translates to the cells of the body through the, through the uh, discussion, through the language that takes place in the mind. The Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, always used to quote a very important wisdom teaching. Tracht gut und werd sein gut. Think positive and the outcomes will be positive. Or as a later author titled his book, The Power of Positive Thinking. In other words, by being able to attitudinally recharacterize the life that you see positively, you create that loop in the brain. And that's why you be will become a positive person. Some people have a natural disposition to be positive. Other people tend to have a disposition to be down people. But you have freedom to change that. And of course, it's much better to be a positive individual. And by practicing those thought patterns, and there are exercises in that program in the back there on how to practice the thought patterns so that, in fact, positivity becomes a default response that is able to change the way that you interpret stress. Remember, I'm not talking about stress management like I never talk about anger management. I don't think anger management is great. Anger management simply says, you've got anger, now manage it well. <laughs> I'm talking about never being angry in the first place. I'm talking about never being stressed in the first place. My past mark for people is 7 out of 10. You don't have to be a perfectionist. 
You don't have to pass every single time. But you don't have to get zero, as you often do in that one provocative situation, that you know how that person knows how to push your buttons, and you fail every single time. I want you to get seven out of ten in that one. That's what the game's all about. How do you do this? See, anyway, you've got to do it. I'm a big uh, fan of Nike. Nike says, just do it. The question is, what do you do? Okay. The question is, what program do I take? The pr question is, how do you practice these things? I know how to practice my times table. Everyone in this room knows seven sixes are 42. Everyone knows that. Why do you know that? Because you've repeated it so many times over that it's internalized. It's you. But have you internalized how to be a pleasant individual? Have you internalized how to be able to respond to provocative circumstances? Have you been able to internalize how to be able to recharacterize what is otherwise a stressor, not to be a stressor at all? It's a nice positive challenge. Let me step back. Neutri neutrality. Now let me see what I can do with this. There must be positive ways because it wouldn't be happening to me unless there's a learning curve here, unless there's a growth process here. Now, I can't prove any of this to you. I can't prove to you that you'll be a happier person by being a positive person who's de-stressed. Some people say, oh, but hold on, stress drives me, you know, um, uh, anger motivates me, you know, etc. I can't prove that they're wrong. I can simply say that my impression of people's health through statistics is that angry people get sicker more often. That's true. Stressed people get very sick more often. And happy people don't get sick as often, even much less so. So if you want to use that as a measuring stick, and I'm not saying that's the sole measuring stick, quality of life is a measuring stick. To be able to be a profounder individual, to be able to live vertically in the moment, to be able to gain more from the feedback of life right now, that's a measuring stick. They're the things that we should be dealing with. And I'm repeating again, and you'll hear this often from me, you can train for this. You can become that. So in this opening presentation of this evening, what I really wanted to indicate is that it's possible for you to go through, at least initially, eight, nine sessions over a four-week period and have a taste of what's possible. Now, you won't, after those eight, nine sessions, become that. You have to do homework in between. Or you have to have a methodology and that's there available for you, and we'll be presenting this for you as well. Now, what I'd like you to do, and Menachem no doubt will be saying that also, is if you really want to be able to take yourself seriously, then you'll want to fill out on the back and sign up. And by the way, anyone who signs up for the course enters in a raffle and gets the next course free of charge, the winner. Not everybody, just the winner. <laughs> But every one of you is a winner in every respect if you allow yourself to win. I thank you very much for the opportunity and I hand you back to Menachem.